Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Davidson. I'm the director here of the virtual Northrop Fry Center. And while, of course, we would all wish that we were, you know, just down the hall there in the NFC, it's it's really great to see so many people. And I know, too, that the virtual sort of platform allows us to draw in some people who potentially wouldn't make it or who are enjoying a fabulous life in other places other than Toronto. Um, I first of all want to really thank Amelia Bailey uh, and Jamie Quadros. They are the people who make the NFC look fantastic and make sure everything functions. So thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Jamie. I don't know if Jamie is signed on, but we'll, we'll, we'll send him the, the recording later. Um, today's talk is a special talk because it's the first of our doctoral fellows. And I think um, Katya deserves you know, special kudos for being the first one to go. Uh, the talk today, is, well, first of all, Katya is a doctoral candidate in my home department of Spanish and Portuguese. Her dissertation examines the topic of linguistic representations of black characters in contemporary Cuban fiction, which we'll see her listen to her uh, describe today, and how these reflect evolving notions of nationhood, class, and race relations on the island. Her uh, doctoral research is funded by Shirk and draws upon literary and critical theory, post-colonial critical race and disability studies, sociolinguistics, as well as anthropology. She's previously coordinated student cultural exchanges in Nicaragua, Cuba, and Italy as an economics and intercultural studies professor. And she's presently the course instructor, a course instructor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She's also a singer and songwriter and a frequent visitor of Havana. Today's talk, Blackness, Decadence, and the Crumbling Text, Linguistic Representations of Black Characters During Cuba's Special Period promises to be a good one. And I hope, wish you, like, I invite you all to join me in welcoming Katya today. So Katya, please take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Northrop Fry Center, Amelia and Bob Davidson for offering me this space um, to share part of my research. Um, the Caribbean Studies Program and the Spanish and Portuguese Department also for relaying um, also the, uh, the event um, on social media, et cetera. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for everyone who is attending on this Friday, this glorious, beautiful Friday afternoon. So I'm gonna start by um, contextualizing everything before going to um, my analysis of Pedro Juan Gutierrez, El Rey El de La Habana's uh, work, okay? So I will start. Um, Katia, don't forget to share your screen. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, yes. Partagez l'écran. Um, desktop. Partagez l'écran. Yeah, I almost forgot that. You guys can see that now? Oh, yeah. Perfect. So, old school. At the end of the 1990s, Cuban poet and journalist Manuel Vasquez Portal was approached by a young Portuguese student seeking advice for writing a thesis on the topic of Blacks in Cuban literature. Half jokingly, he responded that she would have to read all of Cuban literature. Vasquez Portal's comment points to the long history of the representation of Black characters in Cuban fiction. From abolitionist novels such as Cecilia Valdez by Cirilo Villaverde, followed by the Cuban Revolution's interlude of relative silencing of the racial question, and by which the few Black protagonists served mostly to demonstrate the benefits of the social revolution, up to the 1990s, marking the return to the stereotypical portrayals of Black characters that were common to the pre-revolutionary era, such as their sexualization and or criminalization. To go back to our anecdote, nor are their meeting at, and the theme of the student's thesis completely unrelated to the new Co Cuban boom, promoted uh, largely by European publishing houses and coined special period fiction by Esther Whitfield. A genre popularized particularly by writer Pedro Juan Gutierrez, own brand of dirty realism, or what he calls realismo sucio, with his emblematical depictions of Havana's marginal and mostly black populations, namely in his notorious Trilogia Sucia de La Habana. In fact, Cuban fiction published during the 1990s up to 2004 has been significantly influenced by the overall context of the economic crisis, what we call the special period. Critics and authors themselves have demonstrated and commented on the pressures to reveal and depict at length the grim realities of life in this still socialist society. 
and thus at times catering to foreign demands thirst for both authenticity and dark tales about a socialist utopia, gone dystopia. Beyond the facts and figures illustrating the economic impacts of the disintegration of the USSR on Cuba's economy, Cuba's special period can also be considered a defining uh, category of experience uh, as mentioned by Hernandez Regan, that brings up memories of depriva deprivation and hopelessness, of hunger and heat, of wheeling and dealing, of dreams of life elsewhere. In narratives, such testimonies, depictions, have also revealed zones of silence in which Cuban reporters had been kept away by the state-controlled press. Such zones refer to specific neighborhoods with Ground Zero Central Havana, largely populated by the poor, the marginalized, those mainly blacks who seemingly have been left unaffected by the revolution socialist agenda and its social homogenizing forces. During a conversation interview I had with him last December, seated in the whole lobby bar of Hotel Sevilla in close proximity to the emblematical neighborhood of his novels, writer Pedro Juan Gutierrez, still a journalist at that time, while writing a bit in secret, he told me his trilogia and El Rey La Habana commented a tad more on what he termed, termed zonas de silencio. In his words, these referred to zones of society in which reporters did not enter normally. No new story he told me would take place here in a, a solar. So this is Pedro Juan. In a solar, this is a an idea of a solar in Centro Habana. No mention was made of poverty in Havana. Um, no mention was made of Centro Habana's religiosity. Poor people did not exist, he says. It was as if journalism made up this fantastic world in which we were all heroes. Then my book started to appear in which I talked about the anti-heroes, those who have been left behind, those who have no voice. So I do it deliberately because I live there, right there. So this is the thing. So because of um, Gutierrez's depiction, that his depiction dealt with marginality and the lived experiences of criminality, incarceration and violence intertwined with ethnicity, poet and critic uh, Victor Fowler um, Calzada considered El Rey La Habana one of the few works to give the margins of space in contemporary Cuban literature. While writer Ena Lucia Portela, I don't know if you can see her, she's on the, my right hand side, um, considered, insisted on Gutierrez's proximity and skill in remaining faithful to the details. In other words, he wasn't faking it and he was talking about real marginality. Moreover, such details also concurred with academics from inside and outside of Cuba who documented the plight of the mainly black segment of the population who would become further disadvantaged by Cuba's opening to tourism and foreign capital's discriminatory policies. I am um, alluding to the official tourism industry since the 1990s. And thus, um, beginning at on, in 1989, the reappearance of social restratification according to racial background. However, it is not noteworthy that if Portela also signals the truthfulness of Gutierrez's dialogues in El Rey de La Habana for their authentic rhythm and coloring, their faithfulness to the details of the Havana slang, what has not been addressed are the many other levels of significance associated to this literary strategy. While the works of Uxo and Hernandez examine the literary construction of linguistic otherness as a way to signify subalternity of the black subject in the Cuban context, they focus mainly on colonial text. This is a period in which mainly white writers would characterize the spoken language of their black characters, stressing in their text the imperfect pronunciation of Spanish. Surprisingly, the return of this literary strategy that I am examining today of integrating black speech, including lexicon of African origin in the notorious Havana slang, perceived as a negative marker and thus a means to construct otherness in contemporary Cuban fiction has not been studied. 
To stop being part of a larger project, my main objective is to analyze the significance of this literary device, and that translates itself by the hypothesis, the voicing out of historical anxieties related to race, um, such as the return to the primitive, Africanist, the trope of Haiti as Cuba's radical other, and the perils of the recreation of a Black Republic. Um, in the con every, uh, all, every, every time I'm saying this is really in the context of the 1990s. So by establishing the link between perceived Blackness of, uh, of language and decadence, I wish to demonstrate that the use of such a literary device is a way to emphasize the island's socioeconomic and cultural involution during the special period. This is part of a broader discourse that since the 19th century has associated these tendencies to the African or black part of the island's population. So um, if 19, in the 19th century, uh, Jose Antonio Sacco uh, considered the prog progressive blackening of Cuba, uh, which was fueled by the plantation economy, would lead to its slow decadence, its certain intellectual ruin, Rafael Rojas signals the reemergence at the beginning of the special period of discourses tainted, namely by the Haitian peril and overall rejection of um, Cuba's Caribbean character. By extension, we could add to this the stigmatization of linguistic traits at that time associated with Caribbean Spanish, traditionally attributed to lower classes dominated by Black and mixed race population before the revolution and the lexicon connected to sec certain sectors of the Afro-Cuban population. So my analysis is thus um, informed by the following theoretical discursive angles. Um, we have like the psychosocial and intellectual origins of racial anxieties that reemerge and that translate themselves as by the creation of African spaces, Black geographies, geogra well, geographies of spaces in the novel, um, sociolinguistic discourses that have racialized the debate on the impoverishment of Cuban Spanish and that find their expression through character construction in fiction of the 1990s, um, and the role of disability and its intersection with race, both as a literary device and a way to express the reemergence of discrimination and inequalities during the special period. And this, these, um, this, the role of disability also intertwines with the sociolinguistic discourses that I just mentioned. Um, also, here we have um, my, what I find I, I want to present to you also as like a kind of hors d'oeuvre here is that my analysis of um, the talk here on Pedro Juan Gutierrez, El Rey La Habana, is also informed by prior analysis of both editions of a detective fiction novel called Primero Muerto, um, who permits us to appreciate the transition by which Black marginality comes to replace Black exceptionality between the 80s and the 90s. So while the first edition included a black new man protagonist, a new man uh, seen as the chase new man, um, and the Vanna slang is ascribed to a white delinquent, a counter-revolutionary, in its second version and edition version, and with backdrop the special period, the black hero has disappeared, the white protagonist becomes mute, and the Vanna slang is now the monopoly of the black and marginal populations. So the voice of Rafael El Guaguero here, who is talking about that El Mudo, his friend, uh, he spent time with him in Havana. He's talking to him and they're going to watch a baseball game. It gives you an idea that um, of to which, what extent these linguistic experimentation with emphasis on the orality of the black character can go. Uh, so it, you have the orality and you have also the phonetic imitation also in the middle of English. Also, because it was published outside of Cuba um, in um, Uruguay, and thus it was catering especially for foreign readers, 
um, they had to, they found it um, better to insert um, a lexical de cobenismos because to render this language um, intelligible. Um, this language that included carceral terms um, and some of them derived from Afro-Cuban cults, namely the occult language used by the Abequa secret society practitioners. So this is like a re-examination um, re or like a revisiting of a process that was very used during also uh, the colonial um, period. And that posits otherness by creating um, other, other codes, uh, lexical codes. And the, the use of glossaries is very important also for the, my future research because it comes back in some literature in the year 2000. It is there during the 1960s. And anyway, so this is the, the um, before we enter to the main plate. So now we have, so all of this informs uh, my, my analysis now of Pedro Juan Gutierrez, El Rey de La Habana. So um, we, we're, gonna, we're going to examine more how this narrative device presents itself in Gutierrez's uh, novel. So this is the story of Rey, a 16 year old who loses his whole family in an untimely and absurd fashion and must survive in the hostile sea. Uh, streets of Havana, resorting to all types of illegalities in order to in order to survive, or what is called la lucha in Cuba. The spaces in which the story evolves point to a mainly black universe: uh, the neighborhoods of Centro Havana, Jesus Maria and Old Havana, Regla, and Santeria cult site. The explicit mention of pigmentation types by the narrator and by the characters themselves, the abundant references to objects of worships, uh, of worship linked to Santeria or Regla de Ocha, and the juvenile uh, detention center El, Corre El uh, Correccional, um, where Rey uh, is sent and escapes early in the story. Apart from characters such as Magda, Ray's most serious partner, Yamile, another prostitute, and Daisy, the gypsy fortune teller, who share the black population's ruin. The white presence in this space is minimal and mostly the result of tourists seeking exotic and cheap sex or accidentally crossing boundaries, such is the case of the fle fleeting appearance of this tourist do it, doing his morning jogging, seemingly oblivious to his surroundings and to the daily dramas that are unfolding. When Ray is pushed out of his comfort zone, he ventures temporarily in the classier uh, and white neighbor neighborhoods of Nuevo Vedado or Varadero and its area dollar. El Rey de la Habana explores different aspects of decadence, material, moral, and cultural, and this mainly within these black space, and that not only refer to demographic, but, but also African cultural influences. Together, they become the main markers of the forces of atraso, regression, that seemed to triumph on the island at that time. But first, the most visible um, and frequently mentioned marker of decadence is architectural. It is in these most dilapidated areas of the city, marked by a traditional geographic race of poverty, and in which room give to the urban landscape, uh, end of millennium apocalyptic urban atmosphere, and where overcrowding and filth proliferate, namely in this solar divided in 37 rooms, home to more people than what is legally allowed with access to two small bedrooms. In fact, promiscuity and extreme, extreme filthiness characterize this, um, raised living quarters and overall life conditions from the very start of the novel. The very start of the novel starts with, aquel pedazo de azotea era el más puerco de todo el edificio. So it gives the tone to all the rest. Secondly, attitudes and conducts reflect intellectual and moral decadence. For example, when Rey's mother, a former part-time prostitute, expresses violence verbally when requesting her sons to get some water. Rey Nelson, bajen a buscar agua, 
Tata, bajen a buscar agua. On top of signifying her poverty and marginality, the, na the narrator's description points to her physical and cognitive disability. Ella era coja de la pata, walk with difficulty or limped on um, her right leg. Maybe it was a missing leg. Um, y un poco frontero, risa o tonta, no andaba bien de cabeza. So she, he's talking about ment mental deficiency. And he said, um, since she was a child or maybe since her birth. Here, verbal violence through swearing, the, the repinga word here, intersects with marginal and the disabled other with backdrop social decadence. Um, furthermore, um, the author recreates an African space in the city, namely in Regla, a privileged, privileged Santeria site of worship, which ex with explicit references to Afro-Cuban saints, syncretized with Catholic ones, rituals, and objects of worship. For example, through Reyes' eyes, when the pro protagonist ends up in the neighborhood of Regla, on the other side of the Havana Bay. En el barrio, la gente usaba muchos collares. Um, había toques de tambores y altares, altars. Um, he, he ventures for the first time in his life into a church, namely that of Virgin La Virgen de Regla that you, he, you see here. Um, he wit but he witnesses without understanding the purpose of certain rituals. For him, this is, he sees a lady, a black lady entering the church and putting some flowers next to this little black, this black doll. Um, but of course, uh, there's a, um, all of this is not uh, said, like there's not like, oh, we're talking about the Virgin uh, uh, de Regla or, or things like that. It's like the lady is dressed in a way in blue. So that signifies she is a daughter of Yemaya, which is syncretized with La Virgen de Regla. So these, these are like things that are um, in the text, but not, always um, intelligible for everyone. So another way that Africanness is represented in the novel is by the frequent incursion of the Oriental from a demographically black part of the island historically linked to Haiti and collectively viewed as uh, invaders, exacerbating the problematic of already overcrowded and precarious Havana Solaris. Alejandro de la Fuente also comments on the economically mo motivated Make migration of people from the eastern provinces to Havana, another strategy of adaptation and resistance, he says, that has been racialized and interpreted like a black assault on the city. Lastly, the Oriental is also othered because of his linguistic features, which presents more similarities with Dominican and Puerto Rican Spanish. Um, so in his uh, review of El Rey La Habana, Miguel Garcia Posada notes the most sensationalist aspects of the novel, um, that is sex and survival strategies, while draw, drawing attention to the topic of language varieties, the informal and the colloquial registered. I argue at this point that apart from ascribing Ray's linguistic traits to convey authenticity, such a literary device can be considered a way, as I said, um, before to emphasize the island socioeconomic and cultural involution during this decade of economic uh, upheaval. This, um, how this is brought in is by firstly, the inclusion of linguistic features reminiscent of Cuba's plantation economy, the literary tropes of sickness and disability that are, other, are, are also embedded in certain linguistic discourses, and the protagonist's speech acts that both recall the claustrophobic and ruinous space in which he wanders and conditions his limited vision of the world or limited cognition, and thus entering in dialogue with the sociolinguistic socio discourses I talked about before. So the first aspect of it is uh, revealed with the intervention of La Negra Tomasa, which also signify a 
kind of going back to the past, to the colonial and slavery past. So now we have, so this happens with the class C Sandra. She's the hija de Ochum that represents the figure of the refined mulata, uh, but also is syncretized with the Virgen de la Caridad de Cobre that you have here. Um, and she lives in a proper living space and she really marks the difference with Ray's speech acts and when he talks to her with a um, very informal manner, she says, don't, hey, don't tell me, hey, I don't like your vulgarities. You guys are all the same, brute scumbags, foul-mouthed. Okay, son iguales groseros, sucios, mal hablados. However, when Tomasa, a black conga, takes over her, when Sandra is said to be pasando un muerto, her blackness wins over and linguistic traits proper to Bosal Spanish emerge. Um, so Tamasa, uh, so he said, the narrator says she uh, was talking in uh, entangled, un almost unintelligible Spanish. And so we have here some linguistic uh, de orality and the way of putting this into the text of inscribing it, uh, reminiscent of what you could find in novels uh, such as Cecilia Valdez to imitate the voice of the black slaves at the time. Um, in this vein, Dominican E. Pichardo, in his Diccionario Provincial Casi Razonado de Voces y Frases Cubanas, characterizes black speech at the time of the so called <clears throat> Negros Bozales o Naturales de Africa as disfigured. Castilian. Such terminology points to the aesthetic factor, factor also embedded in later linguistic discourses, namely Ferguson's distinction between the high and the low varieties. Furthermore, it is important to remember that white aesthetic crit criterions have, been, have both served to ridicule black speech and bodies, not only in Cuba, but also in the Caribbean. In the context of explaining his preference for the term nation language to dialect, resonating with Cuba's own colonial experience, the late E.K. Bradwaite declares the claims, caricature speaks in dialect. Dialect has a long history coming from the plantation where people's dignity is distorted through their language and the description that the dialect gives to them. Here, the highly corporalized term distorted as it is used in this context, helps us to introduce the idea of a linguistic disability embedded in more, more recent linguistic discourses that focus on the impoverishment of spoken Spanish on the island um, since the 1970s and the 80s and more uh, recently. This type of disability refers to the inability to choose the appropriate linguistic register according to the formal informal context of communication. Carlos Paz Perez in, su, uh, in his article, Lo Duce Amargo de la Black Cubana Actual, talks about this linguistic impoverishment as synonymous with the limitation of options that the speaker has to switch from one register to another, from one style to another. Um, he talks about how people wear clothes, you, you wear formal clothes and formal setting, and that must be the same thing when you're talking in a formal setting. And not to stay always in the informal register. Um, he also cites um, the authority of sociolinguist uh, Lopez Morales, whose allusions to the cognitive functions and the limitation to cognitive functions are implied. The speaker with a restricted register is severely limited cognitively and in his vision of the world. This link between physical disability and linguistic cognitive um, limitations is made explicit in a scene in which a sick man seated in, on the sidewalk in front of La Milagrosa Chapel holds a begging sign full of spelling mistakes. Esta es mi última promesa a mi padre, San Lázaro. Tengo mareos y morir de y mi enfermedad. La termino lateralization of the L, hoy a las seis y media, y voy a ir con ayuda y salud para todos, promesa para respetar. 
Um, so it is worth mentioning that this guy, El Tipo, is said to look like a disaster and maybe the result of polio. Also because Magda and Ray don't know how to write much, according to the narrator, this explains why Ray finds this sign to be bien hecho, well done. Noteworthy, um, and this here, um, is the juxtaposition or the contrast of the already mentioned white, blonde, well-nourished joggers, able body, with that of the disabled tipo here, uh, which voice you find here, with backdrop, these women lining up to get the ration, rat, uh, yeah, ration of this uh, quota of this infamous meat replacement called picadillo de soya, um, too debilitated to catch the bus, or what we say in Cuba, coge la wawa. So, um, Anke Birkmeyer has already discussed Ray's uh, lack of linguistic. Um, capacity, stating that the protagonist um, has problems to communicate even um, minimally. This is an aspect demonstrated more concretely, according to the critic, by the exchange she has with Sandra, and which points to the latter's awareness of this limitation. For example, Ray says, what it, que es fascinado, which means captivated. Sandra responds, ah, oh, no, nothing. Uh, Want to eat something? So she changes, you know, the subject. According to Michel de Certeau, the act of walking is to the urban system what the speech act is to language or to the statements uttered. And thus walking can be viewed as a space of enunciation. By analogy, uh, we could say that raised language limitations reflect the limited speech, space, spaces in which he evolves. Sorry about that. While Whitfield contends that this contraction of city limits to an area that is both so fuckingly small and beckoningly deep, Centro Habana, can be considered a narrative strategy, Gutierrez, in this conversation I have with him, acknowledges that this text also reflects the reality of a tiny, constrained world at the linguistic level, and in which Rey, El Rey and Magda circulate and that culture except certain religious ideas do not reach. This tiny world recalls Ray's linguistic and cognitive limitations. Again, um, Ray is considered uh, bloqueado, he's blocked. He didn't have any ideas, nor religious ones. Birkenmeier uh, also contends that the novel needs a narrator to fill in the gaps in Ray's language and that Ray's actions are what are important in the novel, not his speech. I posit that au contraire, on the contrary, raised language and its deficiencies are important in several respects. First of all, it serves as a marker of the island's social and cultural decadence. Secondly, it participates in this aesthetics of the ruins that permeates the novel. In other words, we may establish an analogy between the gaps in the in Ray's uh, language, elisions, contractions, what is missing, and the ruins that surround him as an allegory of a crumbling social project. So I will uh, finish this talk uh, by a preliminary uh, conclusion here, is that if representing a vanished landscape, architectural ruins stand as re readable, re readable figures for the decay of Cuba's socialist dream, so do raise linguistic limitations. Furthermore, such imagery is in consonance with transnational dialectal perceptions that point to the supposed impoverishment of the Spanish spoken in the island or its ruinous state as the corollary of um, Castro's economic destruction of Cuba. Um, I am citing this, of course. Consequently, in El Rey La Habana, the ruins which are visual metaphor of devastation um, and decadence can apply be applied to the social and individual body. If Blacks have been historically in the history of ideas been associated with crumbling political regimes in Cuba, according to De La Fuente, we could conclude that it is by no coincidence that within the context of the 1990s, um, the author has chosen for Ray an eerie faith. 
his slowly disintegrating body text and its complete annihilation, silencing him and his ruinous language irremediably. Thus, if we come back, go back to the crumbling text, the, uh, the title of this talk, Ray's demise on a metaphorical re 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 level, recalls these other crumbling texts, that is of the ruinous city and that of racial equality and progress during socialism. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Katya. That was a great, uh, very concise talk. And I liked how you mixed in the sort of intro and then took us into a really sort of close reading of the text. Um, thank you very much. We've got time for questions. Maybe if you could just stop sharing your screen so I can see. Okay. I, okay. Arrête de partager. Arrête de partager. <laughs> Thank you. Arrête de partager. Merci. With uh, so many experts on these topics here, I'm sure we'll have a few questions. So if anyone would like to, who shall we start? Don't make me use el dedo. Oh, my supervisor, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I will ask a question for, for Katia. Um, thank you for your presentation. And it's a pleasure to see how your project is developing over the years. And I think you 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 have um, nailed this reading of um, Gutierrez. Uh, it's a, a novel that has been very well studied and you are able to, to find um, new avenues for, for interpretation of it. And um, my question is, is about um, other other texts that you have found in, in this archive of uh, Cuban literature from, from the 1990s. I'm thinking especially about um, Cuban poetry and, and also um, uh, theater that incorporate this, this um, um, black, black Spanish language that you, you are um, describing here. So I wanted to know um, if you have addressed that that kind uh, that kind of archive as well, apart from the narrative. Yes, this, yes, is, this is an archive that I will be um, that I will be um, dealing with um, in the and a part of the my thesis because it has been addressed since the nineteen seventies and eighties. So in narrative, what happens is that these linguistic experimentation come later on, much later on, but in theater and in poetry. And especially, um, I find that a lot of times what happens is, is that the analysis that is made of like the representation of black, uh, uh, black characters, uh, the linguistic aspect is very Havana centric. And it, um, it, I don't know, I'm trying to find also other voices. And for the next uh, chapter, I'm going more to like San Fuegos and Santiago de Cuba and going outside where this is addressed more and more um, earlier than in Havana. I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Susan, please. Okay, I've unmuted myself. Great, um, thank you, Katya. It's, it's uh, really interesting to hear your talk and um, as Nestor said, to see how the work is developing. So um, I, I sort of wanted to focus in on one little point that, that intrigued me where uh, towards the end, you were talking about this uh, intertwining between um, linguistic disability and cognitive limitations, right? Mm -hmm. as, as the sort of these tropes that are working in the text, which I thought was uh, interesting. Um, and you had the example of uh, Ray coming upon um, someone in the street who might have polio and the, his sign has all these very, the errors that are very obvious um, to, uh, to readers of so-called proper Spanish, right? Um, and I was wondering, um, in, in, in that moment, I mean, the, there, clearly there, there are errors there. 
um, that we might read. And at the same time, we might read them as, as markers of, sort of different levels of education or different levels of access to resources. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering if you were thinking about or, or how you might fit in this question of, I guess the idea of disability is something that's structured by access to different resources and possibilities. So to what extent you're reading these texts as kind of marking bodies as fundamentally different and limited or whether um, the literary representations of these different marginalized figures are structured as kind of the outcomes of different social factors I, I, I cause I, them to be that way. Yes, exactly. The like the biopolitics, or or the fact that like um, r reading texts of um, Nirmala Ereveyes, where the transnational capitalism, and and the fact that like you can become disabled according to a certain cert, um, context, and not having access to um, certain economic resources and um, other types of social resources incapacitate, like it, it renders you disabled, you know, to deal with, with life. So yes, I'm, I'm looking into that. And it's, yeah, so the, the socioeconomic aspect is always in the backdrop of this type of analysis on, on disability, let's say. And, and its consequences on the people, on certain people. And, and it also, it's linked also to some studies that point to the unfinished business of um, inequality, because there was inequality and it started to emerge in the 1980s. And then like it took, it blasted out in the 1990s, but it was still, it was, emerging and it has these impacts. So I'm looking into this. Okay. Great, Great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I guess the part of the question is sort of to what extent do you see those markers of the causes of inequality structured already through the text that you're reading? Yeah. Like, yeah. Are, are you being led to those markers or does, does one as a reader really have to look for them and imagine where they fit? I'm going through that, but I'm going also through the ideological aspect that's into sociolinguistic discourses that are even in the island and that were used also to identify um, people to certain groups according to the way they spoke as a conduct, an anti-social conduct. So there's that aspect, but there's also the, the the material conditions that also condition uh, these manners of speech or these, uh, pro um, you know, these problems with um, education or, or writing. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? I'll jump in and take, uh, oh, sorry, Olga, please go ahead. Uh, well, uh, it's also more like punctual. Thank you for the amazing talk, uh, Katya. I got really intrigued when you uh, talked about glossaries and then uh, that you are looking into uh, glossaries uh, in uh, Rey de la Habana, but also in other texts. And you compared uh, the, the, the contemporary glossaries to uh, Cecilia Valdez. And so I was wondering if you... Uh, can see some changes also because uh, it's a long period of time. And if you uh, have come across some more creative ways to deal with uh, introducing uh, like vocabulary, that's like the first part of the question. I have been thinking uh, that um, uh, recently I'm reading something like uh, Miguel Yaru, you know, and uh, he, um, I think, deals with the, uh, footnotes uh, more in a way that it's less um, omniscient uh, narrator who is talking in the footnotes, but rather the, the characters 
themselves. So footnotes is just um, uh, like the text flows more like naturally into the footnotes. And if you have noticed any kind of more creative ways to uh, introduce glossaries, and also the second part probably it's um, uh, if you do some uh, analysis, what because you mentioned abaqua uh, vocabulary as forming part, but what else? Um, uh, what kind of words, uh, if you analyzed them, uh, uh, form part of those glosses? Okay, um, thank you very much for your question. Um, I would say that um, I saw some glossaries um, also in more revolutionary type of of writings um, that are based in, you know, th texts that have been written in the 1970s. And they refer uh, mainly to Afro-Cuban culture. And they were, these were books that were uh, destined to Cuban um, readers, but it's just because this aspect, the aspect of religiosity had to be eliminated, let's say, um, during the revolution, because it was seen as something that was uh, backward. Okay, it's not like we're not in the situation where, where um, Afro-Cuban religiosity is celebrated now, you know? Uh, so everything that was a bit like people didn't know a lot about it, so they would put these terms in um, appendix to the book. And now what's happening is that I have, uh, for the next chapter, I have a science fiction type novel that interests me a lot. And in, in that, um, what I find creative is that, yes, there are Afro-Cuban terms because there's a glossary, but there's Russian terms also. Russian terms because it's like post-Soviet literature. And so there's like the Soviets are there, but they've left, you know, and but there's some words so, so the authoring process or the fact of saying, look, this is a foreign, foreign people or foreign language is also for that superpower, you know, that was at the time and also military vocabulary. So that's what I can find, but I didn't find like the, in terms of the footnotes, but I will look in, into it as, as well. I don't know if I, it's just because I think it's very, uh, uh, how, how do you do that work instead of including something at the end of the book, like in an appendix, in a very uh, like more scientific way, uh, or you can explain words as if uh, uh, more in a natural context to your foreign reader, probably a Spanish speaker from other contexts, but without alienating like the uh, Afro-Cuban culture so much. But I think it's it's an interesting also that you mentioned this. Um, I don't know if uh, it's it's not definitely. I think the uh, direction uh, Rey de la Habana is taking. But overall, if there have been any attempts to um, kind of uh, read. Uh, what is called Russian text, Soviet text in the context of Cuban literature as also imperial texts and yes. not, to, not to clash these two notions and probably don't uh, like see uh, uh, what is perceived as uh, um, like imperial, cold, uh, neutralizing uh, discourse uh, versus uh, like literatures from that uh, those regions uh, full of uh, uh, also uh, religious and ethnic and all kinds of uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. But like the, it's more like uh, I think because the, the in the context of Cuba the idea is that a lot of the literature is destined for foreign markets and they want their foreign readers to understand. So there's the legibility also of these texts um, and by the way, um, Pedro Juan Gutierrez does not um, resort to these um, glossaries because he didn't want that, he didn't want like these linguistic experiments to go to the extent that it is not understandable to the foreign reader. 
But Katya, these are these are paratexts, right? Done by the publishers and the editors. They're not yeah. part of the author's production. Well, well, the they're at the end. They're at the end. And and what in the, in also when I was examining um, Primero Muerto, I I saw that in the sociolinguistic like type of lexicon and they, they have like imitations of conversations that are, and that's the sociolinguist, they have these imitations and they have these glossaries that kind of like dialogue with these books that are novels and that integrate the, the glossaries, you understand? There's like a, there's a communication, you know, there's, there's a link between the sociolinguists, what they're producing, and these detective fiction novels at the time that were very didactic um, and wanted to teach the people, you know, what a counter-revolutionary looked like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Thanks for your question, Olga. Uh, Maylin, Thank you. Maylin. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. I enjoyed it a lot. And my question is more a curiosity. I know, Katya, that you have been so many times to Cuba, not only during the Periodo Especial, but you keep on going to Cuba. So you have an eye that can, can uh, compare what's going on in the society of Cuba since the Periodo Especial till recently last December when you went to Cuba. So my question is about the decadence in the language, the, the crumbling text, uh, it, I am under the impression that is more um, is more that uh, the blackness is happening between black people. No, if I am correct. Now, my question is, based on your experience on what you see in the society in Cuba every time you go back, is this only happening between black people, or the language is being in decadence between is general? among all the population, not only in black people. The, the term decadence, I would like to um, just nuance it because um, when I'm talking about the, the production in the 1990s, I'm, I'm talking about a production that's post-Soviet, that's a periodo especial, that's the end of the world, you know? Um, and it's like, it's as if like it's this language is instrumentalized to emphasize the idea of intercultural economic evolution and the type of um, disillusion, dissolution um, towards the, this project uh, that was supposed to bring equality and and you know progress and everything but when and i never went there during the periodo especial these are like you know i i read about it but i started going there yes in 2008 and it's not just a thing that is you know like uh, that is happening within you know the between blacks or that like whites are taking or you know, they're using these terms. And it's not like to say like, it's not stigmatized now, you know? Now people can't stand reggaeton. That's their only issue, you know? Reggaeton por todas partes. But, but there's not like this, um, I don't think there's such a divide now. I think it's entering the vocabulary. It's more like it's cool. But there's not um, this idea of blackness and decadence um, behind it. I don't know if I um, <laughs> answer your question. Yes, you did. You did somehow. I just wanted to, because the title of your presentation is blackness. So I wanted to know uh, what blackness means when you. OK, because blackness, blackness. And and you black talk. Yeah, because blackness. Um, what I maybe did not say is the link between blackness and decadence is more like something that comes from the colonial period by the Republic of Letters, the intellectuals at the time, uh, and this elite. And uh, Odette Casamayor, who, who 
studied a bit more on the, you know, the special period fiction as well, talks about the fact that this link is like exploited during that period. So it's more like the idea of decay, the idea of poverty, poverty, and and that is linked to, to Blacks, and it, it reveals that the inequalities as such. So this is the, that's the idea of Blackness and decadence. And of course, for a certain time, because certain words are linked to Afro-Cuban um, um, sectors of the population and were considered like criminal or whatever, it it tainted these words, it was stigmatized. So this is how the blackness, Africanness enters into the equation. Thank you. Thank you, Mighty. Okay, maybe time for one more question if anyone has one. I was gonna just ask you, oh, so Mylene, are you asking, raising your hand again or is that? No, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Katya, I just well, I had wanted to ask you about the lexico and then just maybe just briefly, if you could talk about um, the tourist bodies, do the tourists speak? Is, do we also get the sort of, are these Spanish tourists or these Canadian tourists? You know, what kind of uh, language do they bring into the text, if any? In that text, there are two tourists. I, well, there are a couple of tourists. They're, they don't really speak as such. I mean, the it's more the narrator, like the jogger, he's not speaking to anyone, like he's jogging, you know? Um, this other guy that I think he- There's the he angle of sexual exploitation, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So there's these Spanish tourists um, that, you know, they're in Nuevo Vedado and they're like inviting, um, people, you know, to have sex and everything. So there's this sexual tourism of course, it is everywhere. And, and there's this person also, uh, this guy, you know, that wants to cheap, cheap out of this deal with this girl, you know? But her brother, like, is not really happy because he doesn't want to pay. And he's trying to, like, get, you know, to, to say something, but he's not, like, under, you know, understood well. So they, like, throw him out. Like, the guy, you know, he's, like, and he throws him out of the window, you know? So he dies. So this is like that, like it's it's violence. There's no negotiating. People are, and, and that's a bit of the, um, what's very like, I don't wanna use the, it's very, very som, uh, sombrio, like um, dark, because like the incapacity to communicate and leads to violence. Uh, it leads to the demise of the fa of Ray's family, you know, and it leads also to the demise of Ray by the fact that like people cannot communicate and they, re you know, they have the um, son recours à la violence, you know. So this is uh, the aspect. Okay. Well, Katya, thank you very, very much for your talk and for the and thank everyone for their questions and for their attendance so here today. Everyone. I'm very pleased and very happy to have had you uh, give the first lecture. So thank you very much for that. Um, we please, I, I would encourage everyone just to keep their eyes peeled for future events. We will have at least three more uh, doctoral talks coming up in the, in the winter. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to have an in-person holiday party, uh, which I know everyone is looking forward to because, you know, our parties are the best parties. But maybe we should have some sort of drop-in thing where we can just get dressed up and have a drink on our own. We'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, thank you all very much for coming out today and supporting the NFC and supporting Katya. And please um, have a good weekend and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Thanks, Katya. Thank you very much, Professor Rupp. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Bye, Amelia. <laughs>
um, it's a super nice day today, and, and yeah. people came and um, 